Welcome back to chapter five, Eucosinoid Metabolism. So this is kind of where we start to get into um, a little bit more of the hefty material. Um, this is kind of where it seems that people tend to really struggle. Um, so if you are struggling with this part, don't worry, it's normal. Um, and if you do have any questions or concerns, comments, put them down below. Um, we'll go through them, make sure that we understand um, all about the eicosanoids. This is also going to be really important in kind of setting us up <clears throat> in setting us up for a couple of future topics. Um, for the next couple of chapters, we'll start to get into um, inflammation and how our body processes inflammation and kind of what our body does um, when we have inflammation. So some of the lecture objectives, we're going to describe what eicosanoids are and their specific structural features. We want to know the major functions of eicosanoids, identify the sources of eicosanoids, and how arachidonate is derived from membrane lipids, is the activation of phospholipases. Uh, classify the different, the three different classes of eicosanoids, and describe the biosynthetic pathways and metabolism of eicosanoids with special reference to cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase pathways as follows. The major enzymes involved in the synthesis of the three major classes of eicosanoids, the regulation of eicosanoid biosynthesis, the mechanism of action of our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or the NSAIDs that block the cyclooxygenase pathways, and to demonstrate various signaling pathways and the mechanisms of action of eicosanoids through their specific membrane receptors. So with a lot of this, a lot of this is going to come back full circle when you guys get to, I believe it is try, it's either try three or try four, um, when you get into general pathology. Let me actually see real quick which try that is. It's going to be next try, try three. When you get into gen path, general pathology is going to, you're going to include, have a lot of information about inflammation, the inflammatory processes and all that sort of stuff. And all of this is going to come back up um, next try in that class. So the better you learn it now, the less stressful it's going to be later on. Okay, so let's start here at the beginning. So humans cannot biosynthesize a few important unsaturated fatty acids. Remember when we talk about unsaturated, saturated versus unsaturated? Do you remember what we're talking about there? We're talking about the number of double bonds. So we have our carbon chain structure. And when it's fully saturated, we don't have any double bonds, and every single carbon is full of the number, maximum number of hydrogens that it needs. When it's unsaturated, um, either mono or poly unsaturated, that means we're going to be having double bonds. Um, and there are going to be there are certain unsaturated fatty acids that our body cannot actually produce. If we think back, um, there are certain combinations as well. After a specific point, um, the body can no longer insert double bonds, and that's one of those those big reasons. Um, I believe it was after, I don't recall if it was after 12 or after 9, let me double check. Yeah, after carbon nine. So the human body cannot introduce the double bonds beyond carbon nine, which is why there are certain unsaturated fatty acids that our body cannot produce, so we need them in our diet. So hence dietary intake of certain polyunsaturated fatty acids of plant origin are essential for the completion of nutritional needs in humans. So these essential fatty acids are used to biosynthesize eicosanoic fatty acids. These are 20 carbon atom fatty acids. Um, and these are also known as eicosanoids. The eicosanoids are required 
to form several isoforms of prostaglandins, thromboxanes, leukotrienes, and lipoxins. So I want to take a minute here to give us some good definition of these because these this these this specific terminology is going to come back a lot. So define prostaglandins. So prostaglandin is, is any group of compounds with varying hormone-like effects, notably the promotion of uterine contractions that are cyclic fatty acids. So prostaglandins are a group of lipids made at sites specifically of tissue damage or infection. They're involved in dealing with injury and illness. So this is going to be involved with inflammation. So they control processes, processes such as inflammation, blood flow, the formation of blood clots, and the induction of labor. So prostaglandins have a whole bunch of different jobs that they do, and they are a type of um, fatty acid. Uh, I don't really have a lot of space to put these definitions, so I'll put them up here. I have to make them a little bit smaller. So there are our prostaglandins. We have our thromboxanes. Another, it's a hormone of the prostaglandin type released from blood platelets. So thromboxane is released from blood platelets. If we remember, blood platelets are helping to do with blood clotting. Um, and we'll see like these different types of thromboxane and prostacyclin and prostaglandin. You'll talk more. We'll talk more about those um, next trimester in general pathology. So like I said, setting the base here, and we'll talk more about that. Those other ones later. So our thromboxane. Specifically, remember it's coming from those blood platelets, and the blood platelets help with clotting. We have our leukotrienes. And if you remember, leuco, leuco um, is actually talking about the white, so a leukocyte is actually a white blood cell. So it's any type of biological active component originally isolated from leukocytes, so are white blood cells. They are metabolites of arachidonic acid containing three conjunction double bonds. So they are lipid mediators that play pivotal roles in acute and chronic inflammation and allergic diseases. And so there's a whole bunch of different types of these. Um, you'll learn more and more about these um, later on down the road, like I said, in multiple other classes, such as general pathology next trimester. And also, finally, lipoxins. Lipoxins. So lipoxins control proliferation, or the production of immune cells and cancer cells by inhibiting growth, um, promoting PI3K and AKT pathways. Lipoxins act to resolve inflammation by activating these um, specific things in macrophages. Remember, macrophages are the cells um, that are going to eat and consume the dead tissue, the bacteria, that sort of stuff, to be able to break it down in order to um, heal. Um, so it act, it activates these specific pathways inside of the macrophages to increase their lifespan to keep them active to keep them doing what they need to be doing, and that's our lipoxin. Okay, again, <clears throat> you don't have to have the, all of these memorized right now. Just getting you used to seeing these words because they're going to be keep, continue to come back up. So if there's any words here that you don't remember, don't know, don't understand, make sure that you pause and take the moment um, to just do a quick Google search understand what that word means. It'll um, help you leap and bounds um, in the future. Okay, so mammalian cells, except red blood cells, can synthesize eicosanoids, such as the prostaglandins, thromboxins, leukotrienes, and lipoxins, which are collectively called the eicosanoids. Okay, so all, so the cells, except the red blood cells, red blood cells cannot synthesize these. Um, other cells are going to synthesize them. Um, so they're collectively called the are eicosanoids. All of these are examples of our eicosanoids. Okay, so eicosanoids function as local hormones. So when we talk about hormones, specifically we talk about um, what's called the endocrine system. Um, and you'll talk. You should have talked a little bit about this um, in physiology at this point, but you'll talk a lot more about the endocrine system next. Try in physiology too, um, as well as systems pathology in uh, tri4 you will also you'll continue to talk about the endocrine system because it is really important so part of the endocrine system for example we think, think about hormones 
last trimester, we spent a decent amount of time talking about a couple hormones that had to do with blood sugar. So our insulin and our glucagon, if you remember those. So these are local hormones. If we think about local, we can think endocrine, endo being inside the crin, the whole system. There's a couple of different um, types of hormones that we can look at. Uh, spacing on the, the name. What was the last one? And, and, I think yeah, it's it, yeah. Paracrine, autocrine, endocrine, and direct contact. Okay. So typically, when we talk about endocrine, endocrine, the whole endocrine system is going to be talking about the hormones being released and going far away into other parts of the body. So our, but our local hormones are the ones going to be acting right next to each other, really, really close together. And those are our paracrine and our autocrine. So the eicosanoids, they have profound physiological effects at extremely low concentration, and these are very short-lived molecules. So these specific the eicosanoids have very short half-lives, meaning that they're only really lasting seconds to minutes at a time. Um, so they're really only performing their job for a short period of time before they get broken up. So many effects of eicosanoids are mediated by either paracrine and or autocrine mechanisms. And again, you should have talked about this in physiology. So the paracrine actions, they are synthesized and secreted from one kind of cell and act on another type of cell. Paracrine, para, typically means next to. Um, so the, the paracrine, it's also look, gonna be kind of acting on a different cell, but more, still a close by neighboring type cell. Autocrine actions, <coughs> they act on a similar kind of cell <coughs> or on the same cell from which these are synthesized and secreted. Auto meaning self, autocrine um, acting on themselves or similar cells close by. Okay, we're gonna talk about the importance and the major functions of the eicosanoids. They participate in many different processes, processes in the body. So the eicosanoids are going to mediate inflammatory response. For example, rheumatoid arthritis in joints. You'll talk a lot about arthritis um, in the next couple of tries. If I'm not mistaken, let me check exactly when. Uh, it might be part of this try you start into it. No, next try. In the clinical imaging class, you'll start to jump into more. Uh, it's either this try or next try. Uh, I think it's clinical imaging too, though. You'll jump into talking about the and recognizing the different arthritis. Is um, there's a whole bunch of different types that that you can get. There's rheumatoid arthritis. There's also psoriatic arthritis from psoriasis. Remember psoriasis? Um, if you've ever seen somebody with like the super dry, scaly skin. Um, that is that's psoriasis, and you can also that can also affect um, in the skin as well as in the eyes. So yeah, so that so a condition like rheumatoid arthritis, we're talking more like chronic uh, inflammation within the body within that specific local area, but also like with an injury and that sort of stuff, you also will have eicosanoid activation due to damage of the local areas, um, and so you have production of that, so production of pain and fever. Anytime you have inflammation, you're going to be having uh, eicosanoids being involved. Okay, so starting back to the top, the inflammatory response, psoriasis, production of pain and fever, especially with chronic conditions, um, you'll see you'll have typically have high levels of white blood cells um, when you have infections, um, depending on what kind of infection, whether it's viral or bacterial. And you'll learn more about that um, in a couple of tries in your lab die class. So hopefully you're starting to see a little bit how everything is, is slowly coming together. So if you build onto the material, um, you're really going to have a much easier time down the road because you won't have um, as much to relearn. Okay. Ecosanoids also deal with the regulation of blood pressure. We're talking about bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. Um, this is, you'll see this kind of like we're just, uh, you'll learn this in physiology. Um, more towards the end of the trimester, to the middle to the end of the trimester, where you have, um, 
this is actually a typo. This should be vaso. With blood pressure, we should have vasoconstriction and vasodilation for blood pressure. And then additionally, regulation of bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. So regulating of blood pressure, the constricting of the vessels, dilating of the vessels, and constriction of the bronchioles in the lungs, and dilation of the bronchioles and lungs, depending on the situation. Okay. Induction of blood clotting. Remember that was the, um, the thromb thromboxanes and the platelets. Control of several reproductive functions, such as induction of uterine smooth muscle contraction during labor. Regulation of sleep-wake cycle. This is also a function um, of melatonin. Um, and melatonin is connected to another chemical called serotonin, but that's not right, right now. You'll learn that in a couple of different classes, especially in your, like, your neuro classes later on. Regulation of gastric secretion and control of water and salt secretion from the kidney. So regosinoids play a lot of different parts in a lot of different parts of the body. So now we're talking about the source of the eicosanoids. Where do they come from? So these are fatty acid derivatives. All eicosanoids are derived from arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. Please remember arachidonic acid. This is going to come up again and again and again and again and again and again. Okay. That is a 20-carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid. So if we ask the question, can we make arachidonic acid inside of the body? What is our answer? It has to be no. Why? Because we have 20 total carbons, four double bonds, and the location of those bonds, 5, 8, 11, and 14. And the body, inside of the body, we can only make up to double bonds up to which carbon? Carbon number nine. So it is a, it is a 20 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid. So arachidonic acid is the precursor of the eicosanoids, meaning that all of the eicosanoids come from the base uh, arachidonic acid. So our body can't synthesize arachidonic acid or arachidonate. And let me just real quick. So arachidonate I'll just give me one give me one moment. So arachidonic, arachidonic acid is a saturated fatty acid. Arach, arachidic, sorry, arachidic, so arachidonate is the saturated form, while the arachidonic acid is the polyunsaturated form. So they're both going to be derivatives of each other. So kind of look for that. When you see these two names, they're almost going to be used interchangeably, um, but they're still... Uh, their own thing, and we'll see that we should see that a little bit later on in the chapter. Okay, so major precursor of the arachidonate is the dietary linoleic acid or linoleate. Let's highlight that as well. This is going to be something else that you're really going to want to know, not just for this class, but this comes back a lot in your clinical nutrition class in a couple of tries. So, linoleic acid or linoleate which is an essential fatty acid from plant oil, or it can be synthesized from other fatty acids. Dietary linoleate synthesizes arachidonic acid. Then arachidonic acid is esterified with phosphoglycerates and produces glycerophospholipids, which are localized in the lipid bilayer that compose the cellular membrane. So when we ask about where our arachidonic acid is stored, it is stored in our cellular membranes. So we're going to consume our linoleate 
the dietary linoleate, aka linoleic acid. We're going to use that to synthesize our arachidonic acid. Then the arachidonic acid is esterified with the phosphoglycerates, produces the glycerophospholipids, and those become our lipid bilayer, composing the cellular membranes. So later on, when we need to get the arachidonic acid back out, we're actually going to break down some of our cellular membrane in order to release the arachidonic acid, and we'll see that later on. So here is our linoleate. It gets desaturated, and so we get gamma linoleate. Then we elongate, and we get eco, eco-citrinoate, and then we get arachidonate, and this is our schematic conversion of the linoleate to arachidonate. Um, and like I said, in this book, we, we inter use interchangeably arachidonate and the arachidonic acid. Um, so don't worry too much about that. If you just use them as, inter as interchangeable. So the arachidonic acids are esterified at the carbon 2 of glycerol backbone of phosphatidylinositol and other phospholipids like phosphatidylcholine. Arachidonate, present in membrane phospholipids, are released from the membrane lipid bilayer through the activation of membrane-bound phospholipase A2 or phospholipase C. So we talked about those phospholipases earlier in a previous chapter, seeing where it was that they cut the different parts. Let me see if I can... find that really quick. There was a nice picture that showed us where they all cut. I think it was the degradation chip in chapter 2. Here we go. Our phospholipases, see? Where phospholipase C, A2, A1, all of those guys, where they were cutting off the fatty acids. Okay, so phospholipase A2 hydrolyzes the acyl groups at the C2 position of the phospholipids. Oh, the repeat of the picture right here. Very nice. The A1, we're talking about the A2, phospholipase C, and D. And specifically in the chapter, we're to A2 and the C. So phospholipase C hydrolyzes the phosphatidylinositol head group to form 1,2-diacylglycerol, or DAG, containing arachidonate, esterified to it at carbon-2, and phospho-inositol. Uh, Diacylglycerol lipase <coughs> hydrolyzes the DAG and releases the arachidonate and produces monoacylglycerol, MAG. Monoacylglycerol lipase hydrolyzes MAG and releases another arachidonate. So activation of phospholipase A2 and phospholipase C occur when the histamine and cytokines are released from inflamed immune cells. So if you got my notes, you should have this um, already. So activation of the phospholipids occur when the histamine and cytokines are released. So histamine is a compound released by cells in response to injury um, and in allergic or inflammatory reactions, causing contraction of smooth muscle and dilation of capillaries. Cytokines are a number of substances which are secreted by certain cells of the immune system and have an effect on other cells, such as interferon, interleukin, and growth factors. Again, all of these are going to be um, in contributing to the process of inflammation and causing um, inflammation to occur. <clears throat> so the activation of that phospholipase A2 and the phospholipase C um, occurs when you have histamine and cytokines. So, cell, so tissue gets damaged or injured or inflammation starts to occur, 
and with that you get the release of histamine and cytokines. The histamine and cytokines in turn activate phospholipase C and phospholipase A2. Activation of phospholipase A2 and phospholipase C begins this reaction. Phospholipase C will cut off our group here to form the diacylglycerol DAG. Diacylglycerol lipase hydrolyzes the DAG and releases an arachidonate. And then monoacylglycerol lipase hydrolyzes the MAG and releases another arachidonate. And now our arachidonates are now free to then get converted into eicosanoids. Okay, so the histamine and the cytokines <coughs> being released cause the release of the arachidonic acid and then the arachidonic acid can get converted to the eicosanoids to continue that process of inflammation and doing, uh, continue carrying out its major functions. So upon activation, phospholipase A2 is translocated from the cytosol to the perinuclear membrane of the cells following an increase in cytosolic calcium ion concentration. Histamine and cytokines bind to their specific plasma membrane receptors located on the target cell surface. So this is going to this kind of walks through the that whole process where we have the stimulus, the histamine and cytokines come and they bind into a receptor. By binding here, it activates um, phospholipase A2, which produces arachidonic acid, and then it also activates phospholipase C, which gives us this reaction down to create a nut to give release more arachidonic acid. So that's the whole process. All of that up here is is contained right here in this graph. Clinical correlates, steroids, such as cortisone and prednisone, typically if a medicine ends in like this zone, it's going to be some kind of steroid. Um, uh, so these steroids are often used for inflammation or autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Autoimmune disease, that means auto is self, immune, your immune system. So this is when your immune system attacks part of your own body. So like, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, that's an autoimmune disease. You'll see them called just AI diseases. Um, the immune system for rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system is continuously attacking um, the essentially the, the synovial fluid and the joints. It's having an immune response to it, almost like an allergic response kind of a thing. Um, and it continues to attack it, attack it, attack it, which causes inflammation. And with inflammation, you get swelling, redness, pain, um, heat, all that sort of stuff. That's why with rheumatoid arthritis, you'll start to see kind of bulging of the different joints. And those have special names. You'll learn those names um, in your next couple of classes, especially your imaging classes. But yeah, so then we use steroids like cortisone and prednisone to treat those sort of conditions. Um, steroids, they're a good kind of short-term fix. Um, typically, if you have these kind of conditions, and if you're on steroids for a long time, there can be a lot of complications with steroids. So it's actually why we kind of want to limit the use of steroids in the body because it can really mess with um, our hormone levels and stuff as well and cause other issues. But I guess that'll be more classes that you'll um, take that you'll go over that information. Okay, so corticosteroids are used as anti-inflammatory agents. So corticosteroids inhibit phospholipase A2 and decrease arachidonate production. So how corticosteroids or glucocorticoids suppress inflammation, so how do they do it? So if we look up here, let's say we have a reaction occurring, and you might want to actually copy down this chart um, in your notes. Write it out by hand, it helps you really retain this material. And you can add in here that corticosteroids, that story steroids, block phospholipase A2. By blocking phospholipase A2, just like that, 
we're no longer going to be producing this arachidonic acid. We might still be producing some, some arachidonic acid here, um, but it's going to halt the process and we're going to get less ar arachidonic acid, which means a decrease in inflammation. So our glucocorticoids on the inflammatory process, so glucocorticoids inhibit or limit recruitment of leukocytes and monocytes slash macrophages into inflamed areas. So we think, so we saw this before, leukocytes are white blood cells, monocytes are also known as macrophages. These are the same thing, just um, in different kind of stages of development. The monocytes are still inside of the inside of the individual cells, and once they get activated and come out, they become macrophages. Glucocorticoids inhibit or limit the secretion of chemotactic factors um, or eicosanoids by these cells. So chemotactic factors, um, another name that you might have heard before is chemotaxis. Chemotaxis. Um, chemotactic factors are going to be different factors that cause chemotaxis or chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is the movement of motile cells or organism or part of one in a direction corresponding to a gradient of increasing or decreasing concentration of a particular substance. Chemotaxis is kind of the movement of the cells. So, in, for when we talk about inflammation. It's talking about activating all of those immune cells, and then the immune cells start to migrate towards the site of inflammation. So our chemotactic factors are going to send out the signal um, and to have all of the inflammatory cells come and to congregate in the area of the inflammation. So we're going to inhibit or limit the secretion of those to prevent the um, all of those inflammatory cells from coming and traveling to that specific area. Glucocorticoids are also going to suppress the transcription and translation of the inducible cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme or COX2 enzyme. We'll get more, we'll talk more about what that actually is um, a little bit later on, but I'm going to highlight that. That's going to be really important to understand about in a little bit. Inhibit or limit phospholipase A2 enzymes by inducing the synthesis of lipocortins that block PLA, that's our phospholipase A2 activities. So we're going to block, again, we're going to blocking that phospholipase A2. So classification of our eicosanoids, hopefully up to this point, so everything so we learned about the corticosteroids, the glucocorticoids, keep those separate in your brain. How the corticosteroids really just focus on inhibiting the phospholipase A2, whereas in the glucocorticoids do a whole bunch more. Okay? So okay, so classification. There are three classes of eicosanoids. We have prostaglandins, which are five ri carbon ring originating from the chain of arachidonic acid and produced by almost all mam mammalian cells, except red blood cells. That's the second time now we've seen that, so remember that it's except red blood cells, so not red blood cells. So prostaglandins, make sure. Okay, there's a couple of different types. So there's prostaglandin E, type E. Um, those are ether soluble. So you have PGE1 and PGE2 and 3 and so on, and there's more of those. And also PGF. Uh, okay. And those are part of the phosphate buffer, phosphate buffer soluble. The, they're going to regulate the synthesis of CAMP. If you're thinking about CAMP, remember CAMP? That's part of our G protein coupled reactions. Um, if we think about the, if we can think back, remember those G protein coupled reactions? I think I have. I thought I had. 
have that listed somewhere else. Yeah, like a regular, they said this is of camp. Um, so uh, some of our different reactions that are G-protein coupled receptors. Some prostaglandins stimulate contraction of smooth muscle of the uterus during menstruation and labor, and some affect blood flow to specific organs. Wake sleep cycle, they affect responsiveness of certain tissues to hormones such as epinephrine and glucagons. Remember glucagons, remember what they do, opposite of insulin. Insulin is taking everything, the, the sugars in, glucagon is putting more sugar into the bloodstream, and epinephrine, known as adrenaline. A third group of prostaglandins Elevate body temperature, producing fever, and cause inflammation and pain. Okay, so thromboxanes now. These are a six-member ring containing ether. They are produced by platelets, also called thrombocytes. The platelets are known as thrombocytes. Um, they act in the formation of blood clots and reduction of blood flow to the site of the clot. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin, ibuprofen, and meclofenamate inhibit the enzyme prostaglandin H2 synthase, also known as cyclooxygenase or COX, or prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase, which catalyzes an early step in the pathway from arachidonate to prostaglandins and thromboxanes. We'll see a chart later on that kind of shows all these different pathways. Um, so this will make a little bit more sense as we, as we continue down. But yeah. A uh, little clinical correlates, cardioprotective effect of aspirin. So in myocardial infarction, um, it can, can be mediated by TXA2. That's talking about our thromboxane A, uh, A2. However, PGI2, so prostaglandin I2, so there's a whole bunch of different types of prostaglandin, synthesis is blocked by aspirin. However, aspirin um, also causes severe damage to the stomach. So asp drugs like aspirin, a lot of times people that have had strokes or heart attacks, doctors will prescribe them like baby aspirin. And what baby it actually does is it actually will block and prevent clotting, so it thins their blood. I'm sure, if you, I'm sure um, at some point you've heard that where like ibuprofen or aspirin thins the blood. So that's why... Um, they have them take aspirin because if you've had issues with clotting before, either like a stroke in the brain or a clot in the heart with a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, then um, the doctor might prescribe you to be taking an aspirin. But aspirin, um, it actually also, because there is a, you'll learn more about this in your pharmacology and, tox pharmacology and toxicology class way down the road um, in try, uh, I believe try five, try five or try six. And inside of the stomach, the stomach has cells that are producing a mucus um, in order to protect the lining of the stomach from the soup, from the acidic stomach acid. But the aspirin actually um, blocks it because it's very similar to our prostaglandins. So it blocks it, and we get a reduction in mucus, and that's why so it actually will burn your stomach a little bit and causes bleeding in the stomach. So, But you'll learn more, a lot more about that down the road. By now that you've heard it once, hopefully you'll be able to remember it a little bit better. The third class of eicosanoids are our leukotrienes, which are first found in leukocytes. There's a couple different spellings of leukocytes. It's a K or a C, same thing. Those contain three conjugated double bonds. So big things to remember uh, Remember about these. The prostaglandins are a five carbon ring. The thromboxanes is a six member ring with an ether. And the leukotrienes have three conjugated double bonds. Uh, you'll have a question or two thrown at you just remembering those facts. Okay, so they are powerful biological signals. There are a bunch of different types of leukotrienes. One of these is the leukotriene D4, or LTD4, which is derived from leukotriene A4, induces contraction of the muscle lining, the, the muscle lining the airways to the lung. So overproduction of leukotrienes causes asthmatic attacks. Leukotriene synthesis is one target of anti-asthmatic drugs 
such as prednisone. Now we're looking at pathways for eicosanoid biosynthesis. So the eicosanoid family is synthesized into three categories. Our prostanoids, which are our prostaglandins and thromboxanes, are then those are synthesized by cyclooxygenase pathway. Leukotrienes and lipoxins are formed by the lipooxygenase pathways. And our epoxides are produced by cytochrome P450 epoxygenase pathway. So in this next section, we're just going to be talking about the prostanoids, leukotrienes, and lipoxins. So the cyclooxygenase pathway and the lipooxygenase pathway are the two that we're going to really talk about. So our cyclooxygenase pathway, or our COX pathway, it is also known as the prostaglandin peroxide synthase or prostaglandin H2 synthase. Please make, if you have a little uh, list on the side, like I've been recommending of AKAs for the same, the exact same thing, put these in there because you can have test questions where the answer could be any one of these or it could be which of the following is not involved in cyclooxygenase pathway. And you could put all three of these as answers and one not, because all of these are saying the exact same thing. So then there are actually two different types of COX pathways. So both isoforms of COX are localized at the nuclear, nuclear envelope. So that is the, let me pull up a picture, nuclear envelope. A nuclear envelope, so this is the nuclear envelope right here. So this whole thing is the nucleus of the cell. Outside of here is the cytoplasm and the rest of the cell. Um, and we have kind of this membrane around the nucleus, and that's the nuclear envelope. And then like the nucleolus in the middle. Okay. A little review of cells and tissues. Okay, so, they, so the cocks are located at the nuclear envelope and, and in the endoplasmic reticulum of endothelial cells. If you remember, endothelial cells are going to be the ones that coat and cover everything. They're quickly replaced. So the endothelial cells form a single cell layer that lines all blood vessels and regulates the exchange between bloodstream and the surrounding tissues. So sort of the endothelial, the endothelial cells um, within the blood are it's going to be producing our COX, or have our COX um, enzymes. So naturally occurring COX, or COX, is designated as COX-1. This uh, constitutively expressed enzyme provides maintenance of homeostasis by producing a small amount of eicosanoids. The inducible form of COX is designated as COX-2. In contrast to the COX-1, COX-2 is expressed primarily in diseased conditions, as well as in response to inflammation and mitogenic stimuli. So our COX-1 is constantly expressed a little bit. So it's going to be producing a very small amount of eicosanoids, releasing them and helping us just maintain our homeostasis, maintain that balance. When we have something that's really going on, some sort of disease, inflammation, injury, that sort of stuff, that's when our COX-2 jumps into action and starts doing its thing. Uh, does it not go give us the step-by-step? that it did to me. Here we go. Okay. 
So going along with this picture, we have our step-by-step. -step. So our CPLA, also known as our calcium-dependent cytosolic phospholipase A2. So when we, when we talked about what happens with phospholipase A2, it, when it is activated, when um, phospholipase A2 is activated, actually intracellular calcium levels increase due to the inflammatory mediators, and it is responsible for the release of arachidonic acid into the cytoplasm, which we saw that, that uh, phospholipase A2 breaks down that one specific bond and is going to be releasing arachidonic acid into the system. So then the COX enzyme, a.k.a. the prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase, uh, also known as the prostaglandin H2 synthase, has a cyclooxygenase enzyme activity and a peroxidase enzyme activity. The cyclooxygenase part acts on the on the arachidonic acid and turns it into prostaglandin G2. Um, that's an aerobic process and requires two O2 molecules. And the peroxidase part acts on the prostaglandin G2, turning it into PGH2. That converts the two glutathiones into the glutathione disulfide. And then PGH2 is going to be our main precursor to all of our other prostaglandins or prostacyclins and thromboxanes. So we have our CPLA2 gets activated here in the endoplasmic reticulum, nuclear envelope, Golgi bodies, all those things. That's going to release and give us arachidonic acid the arachidonic acid gets activate, activates our COX-1 and COX-2, and our arachidonic acid is going to give, eventually get converted into prostaglandin H2, and that is our precursor to all of our other stuff. That is the cyclooxygenase pathway. And our NSAIDs, so our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so that's the ibuprofen, um, Tylenol, those guys are going to be blocking the COX enzymes, which prevents the synthesis of all of these stuff, all of this stuff. Sorry, it should be the, the aspirin and the ibuprofen specifically, also known as Motrin. Okay, and that's our COX pathway. Our lipooxygenase pathway. Where are our. Let me pull up our lipooxygenase pathway. Here we go. So with the lipooxygenase pathway, uh, we get formation of the leukotrienes and the lipoxins. But kind of really in this child chapter, we only really talk about the leukotrienes. Um, okay. So the arachidonic acid, uh, so we have this really similar thing happening up above. We have linoleate. Linoleate is going to be converted down, converted to our arachidonic acid. Uh, gets put into our phospholipid, the membrane phospholipid, and then our, we have activation of our phospholipase A2. The phospholipase A2 is going to be releasing our arachidonic acid. And then it can go down with our lipooxygenase into our leukotrienes, or we can have it go down with our cyclooxygenase, our COX enzymes, here with our prostaglandins, or it can go and make epoxides with our uh, cytochrome P450. I don't know why this, this picture is, is right here, when in reality, when we're talking about the lipooxygenase system, we're just talking about this right here, this specific step, this specific part. So just reviewing, taking a step back, reviewing again, 
we have our arachidonic acid in our membrane in our membrane we have those two little hormone like structures like um, ligands remember what those are called we have our histamine and our brain is spacing it's our histamine and our cytokines that's it our histamine and our cytokines uh, get activated our histamine and our cytokines go and they bind onto a membrane receptor that membrane receptor is then going to activate the phospholipase A2 also can activate the phospholipase C and that's going to break down the membranes can break those bonds and give us the arachidonic acid and we have the lipooxygenase pathway um, coming at us Yeah, I remember this. I remember this is why I remember I did this whole second sheet because this whole chapter um, was just a little bit unorganized in my mind, a little bit confusing. Because yeah, we we jump from prostate lipooxygenase to the prostaglandins. Uh, so let's do this. Let's actually put a pin in the lipooxygenase pathway. Let's continue continuing with the cyclooxygenase pathway talking about prostaglandins and then we'll loop back around and talk about the lipooxygenase pathway so <clears throat> the cyclooxygenase pathway we went over it um, briefly just a minute ago talking about those different steps activation of the CPLA2 which then breaks down the membrane, gives us the arachidonic acid. COX-1 and COX-2 gets activated. And we end up forming PGH2. Through forming PGH2, then we can form a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, so now we're going to be talking specifically about the prostaglandins, uh, kind of what a prostaglandin is, and more of that process. Okay, so prostaglandins are fatty acids containing 20 carbon atoms, and they have a saturated 5-carbon ring. Uh, an OH group at C15 and double bond between 13 and 14. Prostaglandin synthesis involves consumption of two molecular oxygen. So we're going to use two molecules of oxygen to produce the prostaglandins. So the first part, uh, the first step, is catalyzed by prostaglandin endoperoxide synthesis, synthase, also called the prostaglandin H synthase or PGH synthase, which has two enzyme activities. We have that cyclooxygenase or COX part activity, which adds the two molecules of O2, and peroxidase activity, which converts the hydroperoxide group, the double OH, to a hydroxyl group and synthesizes the first chemically unstable prostaglandin H2, which, also, which is also known as prostaglandin epoxide, PGH2. You can see in this, this is from the, taken from the slides, we have cyclooxygenase adds in the oxygen, and we have PGG, PGG2, then the peroxidase part converts it <clears throat> to give us PGH2 which is what we really want to then move it and convert it to a lot of different things. <clears throat> PGH2 can be reduced to prostaglandin E2 or prostaglandin D2 by specific isomerases such as PGE synthase will convert PGH to PGE2 and PGD synthase will will convert PGH2 to PGD2. PGH can be converted to thromboxanes by TXA synthase, and PGH can be converted to prostacyclin, which is prostaglandin I2, in vascular endothelial cells by PGI synthase. So I would recommend pausing, doing a quick pause right here and observing and checking out this specific chart. So we have the arachidonic acid, <clears throat> which remember, 
back how we got the arachidonic acid, where we got that from. We have the cyclooxygenase part, which adds to oxygen, the which in forms PGG2, prostaglandin G2. Then we have the peroxidase part of our prostaglandin endoperoxide synthase, which is going to convert, which essentially it's going to uh, remove one of those find the here it is the peroxidase part converts the two glutathione into the glutathione disulfide to GSH to 2 GSSG which we see right there okay converting this double OH to just an OH from here, from PGH2, prostaglandin H2, we have a whole bunch of different enzymes all named essentially for what they convert to to give us our different types of prostaglandins. PG D synthase gives us prostaglandin D2, prostaglandin E synthase gives us prostaglandin E2, Prostaglandin I synthase gives us the prostacycline or prostaglandin I2, same thing. And the TXA synthase gives us our thromboxane or a TXA2. So remember this part, how to get, how we got to arachidonic acid, and then how we get from arachidonic acid to PGH2, and then how we get to all of the rest of these. Later on down the road, um, I don't believe it is specifically, uh, okay, so we do touch on it here, but more in your next class in general pathology, we'll get more into the, even more into the nitty gritty of like what each of the prostaglandins, like what their functions are, okay? Okay. Prostaglandins 1, 2, and 3 series and their precursors. Um, uh, honestly, I don't remember being asked about this in class, and he really doesn't explain it. at all um, in the book or in the <clears throat> slides either so I don't remember this being really on um, on the exam or anything either so you can take a look at it if you want this is just kind of um, different series and their different precursors so kind of you where you get from arachidonic acid where you get PGE to eco excuse me for one sec Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, my cat says that it's I need to be done recording, but we'll keep going through. Uh, we'll get through kind of prostaglandins and thromboxanes, and we'll go ahead and pa we'll pause that this video there. Um, like I said, this is kind of a a lot of material <clears throat> in these next couple of chapters. Okay, <clears throat> so we looked at the the creation of these different prostaglandins, and then we look at the different functions. So PGI2, PGE2, and PGD, they are going to increase vasodilation and our camp levels. They decrease platelet aggregation, leukocyte aggregation. Aggregation means joining together. <coughs> Interleukin-1, and interleukin-2 secretion, T-cell proliferation, and lymphocyte migration. So a lot of different new, kind of new things get touched on here. 
we know what platelets are. Platelets are for um, <clears throat> clotting of the blood. Leukocytes are white blood cells. They're for fighting off infections. Our interleukins So the interleukins are a type of cytokine, so <clears throat> a type of ligand chemical mediator um, expressed by leukocytes, by our white blood cells, and they play an essential role in the activation and differentiation of immune cells, as well as pro proliferation, maturation, migration, and adhesion. <clears throat> so long story short, they're in charge of activating and differentiating of our immune cells. And you'll learn a lot more about those specific immune cells and everything um, later on. So T cells. <clears throat> T cells are a type of white blood cell called lymphocytes. Um, they help your immune system fight germs, protect from disease. There are two main types, cytotoxic T cells, which destroy infected cells, and then helper T cells, which send signals that direct other immune cells to fight infection. So the T cell proliferation, proliferation kind of meaning formation. So when your body has an inflammatory or, or an immune response, your body has, in parts of your body, in your lymph system, it has these T cells stored and it's going to cause them to multiply and to be released. And lymphocyte migration, um, your lymphocytes um, are again are in part of your immune system and they're going to migrate to the specific area where the prostaglandins are coming from. PGF2 is going to increase vasoconstriction, bronchoconstriction, and smooth muscle contraction. Unfortunately, this is just some raw memorization. You need to remember what the I, E, and D prostaglandins do versus the F prostaglandins. And then we also see our thromboxanes. This is our six-member ring with the ether in the middle. They closely resemble the prostaglandins, except the ring is composed of five carbon atoms and an O atom. I think it might have been a typo. Yeah, there's a typo. The prostaglandin are a five carbon ring. The thromboxane is a six carbon atom. One, two, three. I actually know. Six member, sorry. It is a five carbon ring and an oxygen, so it is a six member ring. <clears throat> the prostaglandins are a five member ring whereas this is a six-member ring but has five carbons and an oxygen atom, so that's correct. It has oxygen atoms also at C9 and C11 in the ring structure. A lot of this is just extra info. This is what you'll want to remember. Um, thromboxanes are synthesized in the platelets by thromboxane synthase and produces thromboxane A2, TSA2. They cause vasoconstriction. These are what you'll want to remember as well vasoconstriction, platelet aggregation, lymphocyte proliferation, and bronchoconstriction. Prostaglandins and thromboxanes are rapidly inactivated. Their half-life is only seconds to minutes. They are inactivated by oxidation of the 15-OH group to ketone. Double bond at carbon-13 is reduced. Beta and 
a gamma, an omega oxidation of the non-ring portions to dicarboxylic acids. Um, NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Inhibit the Cox system, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, mechlofenamate, acetaminophen, or paracetamol. Acetaminophen is your Tylenol. Um, <clears throat> and this is really the, the key thing to look at. Irreversible versus reversible. This is what you'll want to remember. You'll want to remember that aspirin irreversibly binds to Cox, the Cox enzyme. So that means that enzyme, the Cox enzyme, the cyclooxygenase enzyme, can never again be used. So aspirin is going to bind to it, it's going to be stuck to it, and they can never be released. So the only way that your body can then uh, have another cyclooxygenase enzyme is that it has to literally break that one down and create a new one. Whereas ibuprofen, uh, mechlofenamate, and acetaminophen or paracetamol all bind reversibly, meaning that they will come off and the Cox enzyme is still there. Ooh. Okay. We'll finish this part right here and then we'll come back with another video um, with the lipooxygenase system. Uh, we'll see. Okay. So the action of aspirin and other NSAIDs. So aspirin irreversibly inactivates the cyclooxygenase by transferring transferring an acetyl group to the serine hydroxyl group of the active cyclooxygenase enzyme. This is what you'll want to remember for an exam question that it's irreversibly and this is how it does it. Acetaminophen present in Tylenol. Um, one thing you'll want to remember, he might ask about this, acetaminophen in large doses really affects, negatively affects the liver, so we have to be careful with how much we take. And ibuprofen present in Motrin, Nuprin, and Advil inhibit COX activity by competing for the substrate binding site of a COX where the arachidonic acid binds as the substrate of COX normally does. So this competitive binding is reversible. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop this video here just because it's we're a little bit over an hour now. We'll finish with the lipooxygenase pathway um, in another slightly shorter video. Um, that way you don't have to continue to sit here through all of this. Uh, study hard and we'll see you in the next one.